Hello, Thought Roomies, and welcome. I am your host, Hallie Rose. I am beyond humbled to present this interview to you this week with an icon and a pioneer in the fields of ethnobotany, ethnopharmacology, and psychedelic research, Dr. Dennis McKenna. So before the thought room was a thing, there was young Hallie wandering about her life searching for meaning. And fittingly, a lot of this podcast with Dennis is actually about the search for meaning and the existential crisis that is sort of inherent in the human experience. But at this time for me, there was a series of synchronicities in my life that led me to book one of the very last spots in a retreat at a place called Soltara Healing Center. This was in late April of 2019. And there was a very prominent figure coming to help lead that particular retreat. That person, as you probably guessed, was Dr. Dennis McKenna. Needless to say, my week at Soltara was transformative. I always say this was the week that Hallie 3.0 was born. If you want to know when Hallie 2.0 was born, you've got to listen to some of the other episodes of this podcast. But it was at that time that I realized I needed to change directions. And I dreamed of creating a platform for truly connected richly educational, heart-on-your-sleeve healing and edge-of-your-seat storytelling, which has now birthed itself into the thought room. That week, Dennis and I quickly bonded and stayed in touch after my guest experience at Soltara. About six months later, I would find myself back at Soltara, this time not as a guest, but as a fly on the wall collecting stories of beauty, healing, and personal transformation right from its source, the people coming through the center. So it was, it was there that I had the opportunity to sit back down with Dennis and withdraw some wisdom from the golden escrows of knowledge that he has, both scientific and experiential, that he has been amassing for years. This interview is a lengthy one, but I promise it is worth it. It is jam-packed full of knowledge. We've been getting some feedback from listeners that they feel like when they're listening to our episodes, they just have this desire to hit pause all the time and take notes. That's awesome. So we heard you, and we're going to do the heavy lifting for you. Now, all the episodes of The Thought Room have their own show notes pages on thoughtroompodcast.com that will list all the major talking points covered, as well as the major resources and their hyperlinks. What does this mean? Well, it means that you now get to just sit back, relax, and not have to worry that you'll miss something. If there's a book that's mentioned that you want to buy, check the show notes. If you hear about a documentary series that we talked about, or maybe you don't want to forget the name of Dennis's Mystery School, dope. We got you. It's all there in the show notes. And we're currently working on a store on thoughtroompodcast.com where you'll be able to have immediate access to all the books and resources and products ever mentioned all in one place. And the best part of all of this is everything that you purchase through our store will actually have a small portion of its proceeds donated back to this podcast. So if you do hear something mentioned on this podcast that you'd like to check out, that's one way you can really pay it forward. If you're a big Dennis McKenna fan, this is something you might want to write down. Got your pen? Sweet. Soltara.co slash thoughtroom is a link you're going to want to check out because Dennis is scheduled to return back to Soltara Healing Center for 12 nights in 2020 from November 29th to December 11th. So you can choose your own adventure. You can book five nights or seven nights or 12 nights with Dennis there if you're interested in that. And speaking from personal experience, Dennis's retreats book up pretty quickly, so if that's something that interests you, you might want to consider looking into that as soon as possible. 
And for the icing on the cake, if you tell them at Soltara that Thought Room sent you, listeners can get $200 off their plant medicine retreats. And that goes for any retreat, not just Dennis's retreat. You want to know how to get that? All you have to do is use our personal link, which is soltara.co slash thought room. So that's S-O-L-T-A-R-A dot C-O slash thought room. And if you use that link and you punch in the code thought room at the checkout, you will get $200 off. If you forget this, that's okay. I'm going to hook you up with it in the show notes, so not to worry. Lastly, I'm going to be traveling around Costa Rica for the month of February, so episodes of The Thought Room will be released every two weeks while I'm living that Pura Vida life. If you missed previous episodes of The Thought Room, this is going to be a great time for you to get yourself all caught up because every single one of them it just has so much juicy knowledge for your thirsty brain. So join me now as we enter The Thought Room with the one, the only, Dr. Dennis McKenna. Dr. Dennis McKenna, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Holly. It's a pleasure to be here. So you and I met earlier this year at a retreat that you were a part of at Soltara Healing Center, which is actually where we're recording this from right now, and you're here leading another retreat. Yes. And how many times have you done these here at this center? Uh, I think this is my fourth time. That your fourth time. Yeah. And how's this week been for you so far? Uh, it's been good. It's, it's always nice to be at Solterra. I've uh, had two sessions and then I managed to make myself sick. Um, so skip the session last night. But it's always good to be at Solterra. You know, I like, I like, uh, I like when the weather's cool and the weather's been pretty cooperative this time mm -hmm. last time i was was way too hot for me <laughs> <laughs> yes i remember you yeah. were fashioning things at ice, I was ice a, bags i was attempting to yeah it was pretty pathetic actually <laughs> <laughs> so when you're talking about the sessions you mean the ceremonies the here, ayahuasca correct? sessions yes yeah. and and you and i actually sat in ceremony together this week monday and tuesday and we were talking a little bit about your experiences sitting. Because how, how many times have, if you had to roughly estimate how many times you've worked with ayahuasca, what would you say? I tell people it's somewhere between 500 and 1,000. I, I long since lost track. 500 you know, and 1,000. I mean, that's just a rough estimate. But given 30 years of being involved with it, that's probably... It's a big number, right? I mean, a lot, somewhere between 500 and 1,000. Wow. And I mean, that was a long time ago now, the first time you sat and drank ayahuasca. But do you have, do you still remember that first time? And Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. I remember the first time because uh, uh, it was when I started my graduate work uh, and I was in Pucallpa, 1981. And uh, we had we had an informant. We had a connection before we came. It was it was me and another graduate student that were on this collecting expedition, I guess you could call it. And uh, uh, so Don Fidel Mosambite was our was the first ayahuasca that I ever sat with genuine ayahuasca and as it turned out it was a lucky choice because he he was the real deal you know and he was very kind to us you know in terms of he was just welcoming we 
in those days you couldn't send a text or call ahead or anything. We just showed up in his courtyard one day in his in his dooryard garden and basically said, you know, tell us everything you know about ayahuasca. Well, <laughs> in our very broken Spanish at the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he was a man of few words. He just kind of looked at us and thought, you know, I mean, it must have been like a couple of aliens showing up, you know, just there's a cultural gap, you know, but we had the connection and, and he knew what we wanted. And even though we couldn't explain it very well, but and what we wanted was just to sit with him, get some samples of ayahuasca if possible for analysis and uh, watch him make it, which we did. And, um, uh, you know, and we just had a number of sessions with him during that time and then, you know, went away and did more field work. And I actually came back to see him uh, before I went home. And, uh, yeah, I've sat with uh, the best and the worst when it comes to Ayahuasqueros. And Don Fidel was one of the best. Mm -hmm. And he had a great deal of knowledge and he knew enough about what we were doing, the science side of it, that he understood that I was need these samples for for chemical investigation and so on. So he was happy to provide it. So we, uh, yeah, we. So we, so that was the eighties. You said that was the early eighties. Yeah. So at this point, you know, you had been working with mushrooms for a while. For a while. And. Then you go in and you have an experience with ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. What what was that like? I mean, because they are so different. Well, to tell you the truth, uh, my first two a few sessions with Don Fidel, not much happened, mm -hmm. and I think I was not allowing it to happen. I mean, for me this whole cultural situation was so alien. And so not that I felt threatened exactly. I, I didn't feel threatened, but I couldn't really let myself go. You know, I, I was standing outside the experience. So not a whole lot happened in those first sessions. Later when I, when I came back and, and had gotten to know him and, and so on, then, then, you know, we did more sessions and it was stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I mean, I had had enough experience with mushrooms. I kind of knew what to expect. So it was, you know, mushrooms and ayahuasca are similar. So I was able to have that experience. And what, what for me was more than the experience at that point was just the cultural uh, context, you know, uh, which I really had, this was, you know, this was before there was an ayahuasca tourism phenomenon. This man was part of his community. He had other ways to make a living. He wasn't making a lot of money from being an ayahuascaro. He served the community. And so when we went, I remember the first time that we went, there was, just a very, very humble hut with a dirt floor, a bunch of benches on each side, and then a table in front where he served the brew and had his rattles and so on. And uh, other than my friend Don and myself, we were the only extra heroes there. And uh, mostly it was people from, from the community. And uh, they come because they have a problem, you know, usually they come because it's either a physical illness or some emotional issue, but they, they come for healing, you know, and they come for treatment. It's not about the visions and all that. I mean, they may get visions, but that's not what brings them there. And, and he has, you know, the, the usual shaman's bag of tricks, if you will. He sometimes uses other plants, sometimes does like mapacho fumigation and, and all of those things, which we're all familiar with now, you know. But at the time, it was quite uh, 
interesting, uh, you know, interesting initiation for me, I guess you could say, into the whole thing. And as it turned out, he was a beautiful singer and he had beautiful Icaros. And that was an aspect I'd never experienced with mushrooms. You know, my experience with mushrooms was usually a, you know, solitary, just in silence. And so the Icaros were a whole new dimension that I didn't experience before. So would it be fair to say this was the first time perhaps that you were using psychedelics in a more traditional ceremonial context? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Yeah. I mean, I didn't use even mushrooms. I didn't use them recreationally that much. I, I was not into taking them and going to a party or something, you know, which you can do with mushrooms if you take a low dose. But I always took that fairly seriously. And, you know, my, my uh, practice and my brother's practice, which I learned from my brother and did most of the time was to take them in complete darkness, about five grams mm -hmm. by yourself, pay attention. Hmm. So that's what, that's how it was. So, so the social context of the ayahuasca was, was different and, and interesting, you know, I think the mushrooms and ayahuasca are different that way. You can use mushrooms by yourself. You don't really have to have a guide. You can, but you don't have to. Ayahuasca, I suppose you can use it by yourself, you know, but the recommendation is that you should have a guide or you should have a structured space. It's all it goes back to that set and setting parameter. This is, this is really fascinating. Actually, before this interview, I... Uh, reached out online to our listeners and asked if they had any questions for you. And someone in particular wanted to know about psychedelics and the guide. And is it is it ever appropriate? When is it appropriate to be doing psychedelics with you know without a guide? Um, who is the guide? This is a really interesting and fascinating conversation i think of course i have my own thoughts but i would love to hear you know what you think after after experiencing ayahuasca in a traditional you know in the shipibo tradition and, and and feeling what that feels like would would there ever be a recommendation to do it otherwise well there's there's recommendations and i'm not somebody who tells other people how they should do it you know uh my personal feeling is that the uh the set and setting is important. That that often involves a guide, a shaman, or whatever. Uh, I think there needs to be a structure for the experience, but I don't say it has to be this way. It has to be that way. I because in my feeling, the learning comes from the encounter between you and the medicine. You know, the medicine is the teacher mm -hmm. in a certain way, or not even that. You know, the medicine. I mean, you, you know, people people like to project onto the medicine a quality that's really coming from you. I feel yes. like what the medicine does is open up a part of yourself, open up a wiser part of yourself in a certain way, and you get that download through that way, but it comes through the medicine. So the medicine and your interaction with it and that can take place by yourself. That can take place in a social context. It can, you know, I have known, you know, generally they, the conventional wisdom is that you can't really learn to use ayahuasca without a guide, without an apprentice. You have to do the dietas and all of that. And those are traditional practices, and I respect them. But I think that you can learn from it in other ways. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um I have known people. Uh, I have a good friend who uh, became an ayahuascaro, and he did it all on his own. You know, uh, an Australian fellow who's still practicing, and uh, he started his practice around the 1998 or 97, something when my brother went to Australia. 
and was doing workshops and talks and so on. He got to know this guy named Darpan. And uh, Darpan at the time was a performer, a musician, that sort of thing, but not an ayahuasca girl. But then my brother and my brother and he uh, started, a, well, basically my brother started shipping ayahuasca to Australia, to Darpan by the gallon. He was growing ayahuasca in Hawaii, you know, so he had lots of ayahuasca and he would ship these, uh, you know, gas cans full of ayahuasca to Australia and Darpan would just use it, you know, and learn how to do it. Um, not everybody can do that, but it worked for Darpan. And uh, so he's he's a self-taught ayahuasca. And I, I think one can be, I think, it, you know, I, I, I don't think there's any right way to do this. You know, I think there's a way that's right for each person. And more conventionally, there's a social context, but there doesn't have to be. You know, again, it's this, you know, ayahuasca interacts with us on various levels. One is the social level, but the the other is essentially the biological level. And, you know, you're taking a substance into your body. You're dealing with what that does. And uh, I, think, I think one learns from ayahuasca or any psychedelic, you learn by paying attention. And not necessarily putting too much constraints on it. You know, as you feel your way into your relationship with the medicine, you may change your practice. But it's it's okay. You, it doesn't have to be a set protocol, really. That's just my own feeling about it. I mean, I know that here at Salterra, they try to cleave to the uh, Shipibo tradition as much as possible. And that's as good as, you know, ayahuasca is a vessel uh, or uh, a liquid, I sometimes say. Ayahuasca is a liquid. It will feel whatever vessel you create for it, you know, and it can be appropriate. It can be a traditional Shipibo ceremony. It can be a mestizo ceremony. It can be, you know, some new age shamanic context in Marin or whatever. Um, and it doesn't really matter as long as you provide a space for the person and the medicine to get that relationship. You know, set and setting is only important in the sense that it allows this to happen in an environment where you feel safe. You don't have to worry about those issues. You, you know that Someone is looking after you, and that's helpful. Not necessarily all the time, but uh, uh, you know, ayahuasca. I think ayahuasca. I think ayahuasca wants to connect with people, mm. and so it will connect at any opportunity that's afforded to it. It's up to the people that do the pouring, the people that administer it, and hold the space, if you want to use that term to provide a respectful environment and a safe environment beyond that step back and let it happen, mm. you know, and don't interfere with people's experiences, which is a rule. We don't, you know, if people are in distress, they will let you know. And then there are things that a shaman can do that might be as simple as blowing some mapacho or, singing an ikaro if people get into a state of anxiety. But in general, I think people are better off, you know, within that context of, of safety and so on, they're better off just to concentrate on their own experience. Mm. Yeah, I, I like what you said. And I, I think that it's important to emphasize, at least in my view, and it sounds like in yours, that ayahuasca really is a medicine. Mm, and, um, yeah. you know, there are drugs and then there is medicine. And I think the context and the reverence with, with which this medicine is usually hopefully consumed is, is really what sets it apart from, you know, say street drugs and, and party drugs. Right, right. But again, the, the, the medicine, it is medicine. It's also a drug. I mean, mm -hmm. let's face it, you mm -hmm. know, 
two words for the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you can use these other medicines in the same way. I mean, right. MDMA, for example, mm-hmm. is a synthetic medicine. But again, the you know the the the, the medicine, whatever it is, is uh, only part of this dynamic interaction. Mm-hmm. You've got set and setting. You've got the medicine whatever it might be, and you've got the dose. So those are the variables, you know, and they're called, you know, the medicine is whatever it is, and the dose is whatever you decide. The most complex part of this relationship is, of course, the setting, or the set, I mean. The setting is, like I say, it can be traditional, ritual. I think the the experience needs a structure, but the set is the most complicated part of it because the set is you. Hmm. You know, the set is what you bring to it. People sometimes say, well, the, by the set, you mean your mindset, your intention, your. And it can be that, but you do not have to have an intention to take ayahuasca or any of these other things. Your intention can be teach me what I need to know mm-hmm. or give me a chance to learn what I need to learn. These days, that's usually how I approach it. I'm not, I'm not asking for, I mean, some there are exceptions. I'm usually not asking for insights into any specific thing or my relation with my father, these sorts of things. I mean, I've kind of done that, you know, and what I take ayahuasca for is to learn whatever I need to learn. You know, we have a saying, ayahuasca gives you what you need, not always what you want but always what you need. And so to put light constraints on it, you know, is is the way I like to approach it. But again, not making judgment on any other person because they may take it for a specific reason. They may have issues that they really want to double down on, and that's fine. You know, that's their own personal thing. Ayahuasca, psychedelics in general are you know, one of the few things in life that you can't delegate to anybody. You know, you can't, I can't, I mean, I can tell you, you know, go take ayahuasca and then give me a full report. But it's not my experience. It's a report of your experience. There are just certain things, you know, that a person just has to do for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, be born, die, die make love, all of those things are not delegable activities. You know what I'm saying? Taking a psychedelic is like that, you know, and it's like the, it's in that category. And it's also, I think, uh, you know, and the research supports this, you know, we, we, we live our lives in a way very often just because we're so busy that we're not so reflective, you know, and we, uh, you know, things happen and life is routine and, and, you know, we go on. But what psychedelics are, are these very special experiences, you know, Roland Griffiths and the psilocybin researchers, they don't call them mystical experiences because They have aspects often of mystical experiences, but they call them personally meaningful experiences. And I think our day-to-day lives are so bereft of meaning most of the time that to be able to set aside a special place, a special time, call it a sacred space and a sacred time, if you like, a little bubble of space-time where you can let this experience happen, that becomes entrained into your memory, you know, and you can think, you know, you you tend to remember the things about life that were unique and special experiences am- amongst the whole, you know, mishmash of, of total experience. I mean, I can't remember a lot of things that happened in my life, but I remember the the big psychedelic experiences. And and other meaningful experiences like that, you know. So, so I think that is, uh, I think that's a big reason why people are attracted to psychedelics, especially in our culture, 
because our culture has gone out of its way to sort of remove meaning from from life, you know, and uh, you know we we have so many different things to distract us, so many entertainment options and all this. And it begins to look a little frenetic after a while. What are you looking for? You know, um, the next big thing, the next whatever. People people uh, have numerous ways to fill their time. Sitting and thinking is not valued in our culture, yet that is one of the most valuable things you can do. Just sit, just be. You know, as Ram Dass said, be here now. We're not very good at that. And it's important that we that we try to learn that. And, you know, I am not speaking about this like I'm some sage or anything because I, I am faced with the same challenge as everybody is, you know. And we're all struggling, I think, to find meaning in our lives. And... Uh, our society is set up to make sure we don't do that, you know, or to make that difficult. So I think that's one of the differences between uh, indigenous people and uh, and westernized people or civilized people, even I would say maybe even literate people. I'm not sure, but if you, you know, if you go into the forest with a, a shaman or just an indigenous person, what you see in that forest is probably very different from that what that other person sees. He or she has a different way of looking at the world. Certain filters that we have are not there for them, you know, and certain filters that they have are not there for us, you know. I mean, they, but again this comes back to the fact that everyone's uh point of view is unique do you think those worldviews those filters so to speak are malleable yeah yeah mm. yeah yeah uh i mean if they're not you're in trouble you have to be you have to be able to change your worldview you know but there there're levels and levels of uh of depth and richness in your perception. And I, I think one of the things that psychedelics do reliably is they uh, they bring the background forward. You know, they lower these gating mechanisms. You know, we've talked about, I often talk about how we construct our own reality hallucination and we proceed to live inside it. And it is a hallucination or it is a sort of narrative that we construct for ourselves so that we can make sense of the world. And, uh, you know, the, the catchphrase these days in neuroscience that talk about the, the default mode network, you know, and the default mode network is a bunch of different things. It's, the, it's, a, it's a combination of habitual ways of perceiving, behaving, combined with memories, combined with associations, combined with predictive algorithms, if you will, you know, we deal with the future, we deal with the present based on our past, you know, because our past is the only thing we know, you know, and, and so you make predictions. So this, this uh, default mode network is temporarily disrupted by psychedelics. And one of the things that a big feature of the default mode network or this reality hallucination is it's an interface between you and the external world. We'll grant for the minute moment that it is external. We can go down that rabbit hole mm -hmm. another time, but it appears to be external. And if everything was just rushing through our sensory receptors, our eyes, our ears, all of this, if all of that got through, we'd just be totally confused all the time. So these neural gating networks, which is now that we know that's what they are. They're, you adapt to an environment by setting up filters so that what does get through, you know, a lot of 
this neural network or this 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 default mode network is based on what it doesn't let in, you know, what it keeps outside in the background, you know. But for indigenous people, I think they have a different perception of it. I think the background is very much more present. And they will be aware of things going on if you're in a natural environment that that we are not. Do you think there are um, spiritual repercussions for that, for us in the West, with not being in as in touch with that? Yeah, I do. I think that there is a... Uh, I would. I mean, there's there's a spiritual aspect to it. I don't know if that's the right word. I think that, I think that, being able to go into a natural environment and just open yourself up to what's happening, you don't have to take medicine for this. You can just go into the forest or into a wilderness place and just sit quietly and just observe what's happening. Outside, inside, look at this relationship and just just be open to it. Those are altered states almost as much as any psychedelic. The psychedelic sort of triggers that and facilitates that. But you can train yourself to have this without any medicine, mm. you know. And and I think what it what it results in is a much greater appreciation of the connection between you and nature and this understanding, you know, again, grading over into the mystical experience side of it, but this, I, this understanding that we're, we're not separate from nature, mm -hmm. you know, we are part of nature. We're part of this process and, and that nature, which in some way is reality itself, is much more miraculous, marvelous, wonderful that we give ourselves an opportunity to appreciate most of the time because we're all so busy consuming mm. information, entertainment, all of the things that modern life puts in front of you. This has resulted in a separation between most people in the so-called developed world and the natural world. And I think it's pervasive as a, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a neurosis of our culture. It's it's basically a sickness, and it is, uh, you know, it's we're seeing the consequences of it in in terms of what we do, what we are doing to the environment. I mean, this this is really emerging from a place of thoughtlessness and just not being attuned to that relationship. Of course, we've got 2,000 years or more of history to uh, to reinforce this separation from nature, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that's, I think that's a huge mistake, you know. Yeah, yeah. Psychedelics, you know, I, I like that you bring up this point. Psychedelics are really just one way in which to hook into that sort of numinous, otherworldly sense of alert beingness. Yeah. yeah. You know, of course, there's meditation. There, there's many other ways. I was reading The Power of Now, um, Eckhart Tolle, and he was talking about becoming aware of um, space, the space in between material objects mm -hmm, like trying mm -hmm, to sense into mm -hmm. that and then also when listening to sound yeah what's in between the pay sound. attention to mm -hmm. the silent intervals exactly yeah, yeah that that's that's very wise mm -hmm. we need to you know we would appreciate more how complex and how rich you know perception is i i, I think uh I think of psychedelics as a lens. You know, you can use the lens to look at the look at look at yourself or look at the external world in a way that you never have before. So it's an instrument of perception. And uh, you know, there there's an author I like very much who writes elegantly about these things. Uh, 
It is said his name is Simon Powell. Have you read any of his work? He writes about magic mushrooms. He's written three books that I'm aware of. One is called The Psilocybin Solution. That was his first one. The second one was called, uh, um, what was it? Darwin's Unfinished Business, Intelligence in Nature. The third one is called The Magic Mushroom Explorer. But he makes the point that uh, this uh, idea that it, it, it can, you know, that psychedelics can be a lens and it lets you focus on, you know, weird things, more metaphysical things, but it also enables you to look at ordinary phenomena just ordinary things in the environment that you never looked at closely before, mm. you know, and you can see processes and, and interactions and things going on that they're always in the background because we're conditioned to suppress the background. Psychedelics force you to stop, sit down, be quiet, take a closer look at what is happening all around you. And if you do that, you can hold that space long enough, then you realize that, you know, there's a whole lot of things that are going on really in any environment, but in nature, of course, it's, it's much more apparent. So I think psychedelics can be used to, you know, you can train yourself to look at things that way. Are you familiar with an author called, uh, named uh, Stephen Herod Buner? Okay. Well, he writes about this stuff too, uh, very well. He wrote, several books, one called The Secret Teachings of Plants, uh, one called The uh, Plant Intelligence and the Imaginal Realm. Uh, but uh, what he, a lot of what he writes, he talks about these things. He's very interesting because he's a poet, but he's also a scientist, and he combines those two things. And for him, you know, science is a is a poetic endeavor almost. It's almost as though... You know, through the lens of science, you can uh, see, understand, and appreciate how fundamentally miraculous things are. You know, I mean, miracle is not a word that should be bantied about lightly, and maybe it's inappropriate here, but just how uh, much richer the context of being that we're that that we're immersed in can actually be. Our sensory gating mechanisms are are sometimes too efficient, mm -hmm. and they cut us off from many channels of appreciation and understanding that would normally be available to us. You know, and uh, you know this is one of the problems with science. Science tends to focus on. Science is a very powerful tool for understanding nature, but it, it, it does so by ignoring a lot of stuff, essentially. Science is very good for drilling down on particular phenomena and understanding them in depth, you know, but it's not so good in putting together the, the whole picture. How mm. does all this fit together with everything else? That's what philosophers are supposed to do, I suppose. And and I think uh, deficiency in science these days is that uh, the way the academic programs are set up, people are taught to be good technicians, uh, you know, and they end up being technicians. They don't give much thought to what they're really trying to do. You know, they know how to run the machinery and crunch the data and do all these things that you're supposed to do as science scientists. But what does it all mean? You know, mm -hmm. they forget to ask that question. Mm -hmm. They're too busy going to the next experiment, going to the next conference, getting the grants, doing all the things you have to do to be successful as a, as an academic scientist, you know, mm -hmm. which is probably why I was a miserable fa failure as an academic scientist. Cause I was not really motivated to do those things. I practiced science, but what drove me was just curiosity. And I think that's a, you know, a desire to understand. And I think that's one of the, you know, chief things that uh, we have as primates that 
that is uh, very precious, this, this curiosity, this desire to know. And uh, that is also something that drives science, you know, just uh, wondering about the world and the way that it works. And the, uh, you know, the psychedelics can provide insight into that. Again, a lens through which you can look at things. And this has been documented many times, like, uh, you know, uh, Watson, or I guess it was Crick, who finally admitted on his deathbed, practically, that LSD had given him many insights about the double helix and how all that worked. And he didn't really want to own up to it, but I guess he figured at a certain point it was okay to acknowledge that. Another uh, fellow like Kerry Mullis, another uh, molecular biologist who discovered the uh, polymerase chain reaction, which revolutionized molecular biology, but he is quite out front that he could get down with the molecules, as he said, and look at these processes and see how how it all worked at the molecular level. Didn't and, you and have an experience with photosynthesis? I had an experience with photosynthesis. Can you talk about yeah. that a little bit? Well, it was, it was a similar kind of thing, you know? I mean, I was certainly not... You know, I, I know enough about plant biochemistry to know how photosynthesis worked. And when I took uh, ayahuasca, uh, the first time I took ayahuasca with the UDV, um, it was in a, in a temple uh, after one of their conferences. And there was, uh, you know, there were maybe 500 people in this temple taking ayahuasca. And uh, I... Uh, and speaking in Portuguese, we were in Brazil. So I was kind of left off the hook. I didn't have to pay attention. And I had a profound uh, experience of photosynthesis. I, I, I mean, genesis of it was that the, the UDV have a, have a concept of uh, ayahuasca as being a combination of the force and the light. You know, and the Banisteriopsis supplies the force and the Chakruta supplies the light. So I was just thinking about that in my state and how appropriate that was. And, uh, you know, that that was the perfect, you know, way to characterize what ayahuasca was. And, and at that point, I got uh, a little voice came over my left shoulder. It's always over the left shoulder. And it said something like, you want to see force? I'll show you force. And then the trip began. And I was down under the, under in the subterranean realms of, you know, I, in, with the tangled root systems of the ayahuasca. And I was, I, realized because the little narration continued this is kind of this is what's happening and so you started underground i started underground in in the roots I, the ayahuasca root or yes mm -hmm. i mean the the ayahuasca well no i didn't really start underground i uh <laughs> <laughs> i have to reconstruct this i wrote about this in my book i was actually when that started that whole thing i was like suspended in orbit over the Amazon. I could, I had a view from space and I could see the rivers. I could see the sun shining on the rivers. I could see, you know, this vast expanse of green, like mold on a Petri dish, you know, and then, it, and then the message say, okay, now you're going to see force. And the next thing I knew, I was under the ground and I was being trans, I was a water molecule. I was being translocated through the roots, through the osmotic pressures up into the plant, into the leaf and into the chloroplast. And I could see all of these processes going on, which have to do with the, uh, you know, photosynthetic pigments gather the light, they use the light to ionize water to get the, uh, the, the proteins from protons from water, the hydrogens to use in reduction reactions, right? And so uh, 
as it turned out, I was one of these water molecules. So I underwent this dissolution. And, you know, I mean, I wrote in detail about it in the book. I can't really reconstruct in the, it. In the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, your most recent book? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I guess it's the kind of mystical experience that you, that biochemists have, you know, maybe when you really see these processes and you would think that it would have, you know, such an emotional component. But for me, it was like totally emotional and I could see this. I could see how important plants were and photosynthesis because of you know, it was in keeping everything on life going. And, uh, you know, ever since I had that experience, I sort of become an evangelist for photosynthesis, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and for the plants, so, but that was uh, that was that was an important lesson because I saw all this. I went through this process, you know, and at, at the end of the process, I was again, I was again above the Amazon, you know, sort of at the at the end of the movie, and I was just, but in a completely uh, almost despairing emotional state because I, you know, I was saying what is going to happen? What is going to happen to the Amazon? What is going to happen to the planet? And that's when the answer came back. It was, uh, you know, which I've often repeated, you monkeys only think you're running the show, mm. you know, and we're not going to let this happen. We being what? I understood it to be the community of species, you know, and I think, I think that you know, I'm I'm a believer in in the in the Gaia hypothesis, the idea that the community, that the whole Earth, the biosphere itself, is an intelligent organism, and like all organisms, it tries to, uh, you know, ensure its own survival. And, uh, you know, the message I got at that time was that, you know, it, it not necessarily that you shouldn't worry about it, but that it's, it, it, you know, life will survive. Life will survive. What mm -hmm. we will do to the planet before, before we wake up is, uh, is a question, you know, that we're now facing even more, you know, I mean, we're right up against it now. This is what disturbs me. And I mean, many things disturb me, but I think, you know, we're right at the cusp of, of the point in the, in history and, and really in, in evolution where the choices that we make in the next 20 to 30 years will determine whether the plant remains habitable or not, or habitable enough for, for humans. You know, I, I think that uh, I think that I think that life is going to survive for a very long time, but whether it will be any kind of you know life like us, I don't know. We are not invulnerable, and we are at risk. And uh, if if the community of species determines that we're the problem, you know with the continued existence of life on the earth, then we'll probably be taken out some way. And there are all sorts of ways that can happen. So you think it's possible. Well, I heard you say once that the plants will be fine. It's us. That's not going to be around. Is, is there some part of you that thinks it's possible the plant intelligence could identify us as the biggest major threat to the ecosystem and insidiously sort of unhatch this this plan to <laughs> wipe us out. I mean, we know about like even fungal networks and how 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 they stretch for they just stretch for so far and they communicate, you know, to each other. And I I don't think the I don't think the plants have a plan to wipe us out. <laughs> oh, I hope not. I think they have a plan to wake us up. Mm. And that's what you're seeing. That's mm. what all of these medicines, you know, ayahuasca, these other plant medicines have suddenly, 
you know, I mean, in, in the scale of evolutionary time, it's sudden, you know, but ayahuasca has been sort of biding its time in the jungles of the Amazon that it, it under the stewardship of indigenous peoples, but now it's escaped and, you know, it's sort of all over, it's, it's all over the world now. And in a way it's kind of, you know, stepped out to propagate this message that it has that, you know, we do have to wake up to what we're doing to the planet. And I think that, uh, you know, plant medicines, here, here's the thing. If we're going to, if we're going to save nature, if we're going to do what we can to avert what is happening on, on the global scale, the global ecosystem, we have to shift our consciousness first. We have to shift our understanding first, change our understanding of our relation with nature. And then in the light of that realization that we're part of nature, that we do not own it, it does not exist for us to exploit, we have to figure out how to partner with nature. Not even, you know, we're not even in control. We are definitely not in control. It's not like we can suddenly realize and say, well, we have to do something about this. I think what we have to do is realize that the monkeys aren't running the show. Mm -hmm. So we have to we have to move more toward symbiosis, mm -hmm. which is something that uh, you know we're not very good at. You know, uh, we we tend to keep nature at arm's length, you know, and we get from it what we want, but we give very little back. We've got to, uh, we've got to change that equation mm, while, while I, there's time. I've heard you talk about symbiosis before and this idea of not only our, our human bodies being like a super organism, yeah. but then like as below, so above, you know, as within. So without this idea of the multiverse and and that being another just super organism that we're yeah. a part of yeah that's really really fascinating yeah i mean the whole biosphere is a super organism mm -hmm. you know and and we're just a small part of it we are just and, then, and at this particular juncture you know we're we're probably the most problematic part of it here's the thing there's never been a species on earth Yet, I mean, we're the first where we're able to manipulate energies and and technologies that are so powerful that potentially they could wipe out a great deal of life on Earth, if not wipe it out entirely, certainly set it back, you know. So we have invented these technologies. We're very very clever but we're not wise this is the crux of the whole thing we've reached a point where our restless brains our restless hands opposable thumbs and all that have enabled us to create artifice create artifacts that you know have these potentially very serious consequences if we know how to if we don't figure out how to use them beneficially and we have to at some point make conscious choices we you know we we should uh you know we have to get away from hubris we have to get away from scientific arrogance and we have to uh get uh, sort of accustomed to the mindset that uh just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something you know, we're, we're, we're very good at doing these things that, you know, affect these kinds of forces, but, but we're not very good at predicting the consequences or pulling back and putting the brakes on and say, wait a minute, you know, let's not do this. Let's think about what the consequences of that might be. You know, if we had a better way to, uh, you know, in some ways, a more future, a, 
I mean, we, we all think that we should be focused in the present, and that's true in a certain sense, but we also have to be able to think intelligently about the future. And, you know, what we do today will affect generations and generations, uh, you know, as it already did, as it's doing right now. You know, if we had woken up 30 years ago and started to respond to some of these environmental challenges that are now getting critical, we'd be in a lot better shape than we are now, you know. But as a species, we seem to be, we seem to be a species that only wakes up to a crisis at the last minute. And then we have to take draconian measures. We, we either can't do anything because it's too late or we have to respond in such a way that the consequences of the response might be as bad as the thing itself. And that's kind of the state we're in right now, you know. Um, and it's not like we didn't see this coming, you know. We saw it coming, but we're very good at denial. And, and uh, people, uh, you know, as a species, we like inertia. We like the, the ordinary. We like to think that it's always going to be like this. You know, and we don't have that that cultural, that historical perspective that, no, it isn't always going to be like this. And it wasn't always like this in the past, you know. So the way things are now, people are invested in the way things are now. This is what drives me crazy about the political discussion, you know, the denial of climate change, the denial of what we're doing. It's just idiocy. You know, denying it doesn't make the doesn't make it not true. It just creates disincentives to try and do something about it. Even though maybe as a species, there's very little we can do about it. But we could we could try and partner with nature and let nature heal itself. And we're not really doing that. You know, and we have the technology. We we know what needs to be done. But it can't be done without everybody changing their lifestyle, you know, radically, you know. And another obvious problem to all this is, I mean, what it, there are too damn many people, you know. There are 7 billion of us and growing people using resources, people, and they have to be sustained somehow. I'm not sure how you deal with that, you know. I mean, uh, it's a tough problem. It, I mean, it's hard to talk about because it's a pretty grim picture. It's a fairly grim picture, yeah. And and I think for some, when they hear a message like that, they just want to turn around and put the blinders on because it, it, it sure. all feels it, too much, right? Right, it's not a comfortable message. No, it's not. You know? But not listening, not waking up to it is not going to solve the problem. You know, it will, sooner or later, it's going to be in your face. It's going to be in our faces. It, it is, in fact, you look at these mega weather events, these huge super hurricanes, the, what happens every summer with the, with the heat bubbles that cover continents. This is what climate change looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, this is... Uh, and people that, you know, people just don't want to see it. So uh, what can be done? Well, you can take med plant medicines and wake up to it, you mm -hmm. know, or you can wake up to it some other way. I don't really know the answer. I think you've got to, I, I think that, uh, you know, plant medicines can be a catalyst for consciousness change on a global scale. Somehow you have to get the right people to take these things and, and wake up. Mm -hmm. You know, who are the right people? I'm not sure. But people who maybe are in a position to influence things, people who can set policy, people with positions of power, and government, science, all of these things. The problem is that many of those people, they do have positions of power and prestige, so they have, in their own perception, a vested interest to keep things the way they are. Mm -hmm. You know, look at the grip that the fossil fuel industry has on the economy. 
and the whole mindset that, you know, we have to continue to mine petroleum in all forms and consume it. No, you know, the program, the agenda should be make fossil fuels obsolete, create a situation where we don't need fossil fuels. And we know the path to that, you know, and, and people think of the economy, you know, that, that we have this, uh, this view of the economy that if, if an economy that is healthy is an economy that's growing. So if there's not, if there's not growth in the economy, then, you know, it's an economic crisis. It's not a successful economy. We have to turn that around and, and understand that a steady state economy is better. That doesn't increase consumerism. How is it going to, you know, I mean, I wish I had answers to this. I don't. How is it going to, you know, more and more people are being born, you know, and we have 7 billion now and counting. Um, And we're putting a lot of strain on all the systems that that sustain life. Mm. I mean, what one possible approach to this that could play out over a couple generations that would take a lot of pressure off is if every woman said or decided to have no more than one child, Hmm. you know, that single thing would lead to a demographic collapse over a couple of generations. But, you know, the Chinese tried this through policy and it didn't work. There has to be a global sort of consensus that, you know, If a woman decides not to have a child, that's a gift to the world. I mean, the child itself is a gift to the world, but a different kind of gift. You know what I'm saying? Again, it comes back to this thing about deciding not to do something, deciding not to, you know, buy that second car or do, you know, the things that are going to have that impact, learning to, to, you know, pull our elbows in a little bit and live more lightly on on the planet you know and it's it's a it's a tough uh it's a tough existential situation you know i mean people could say well for instance i i propagate this message you know i talk this talk but in order to do it i go all over the world you know and i feel really badly about that about but then I'm just one person that's using, you know, contributing to that carbon burden that that international air travel creates and these other things. So I'm a hypocrite. Yeah, I guess. I guess I am. <laughs> but we can't, you know, I, I, I justify it by saying for myself personally, it's like, this is a message that I feel compelled to to put out there. It's a message that people need to hear. And so I'm absolved of guilt for traveling all over to, to do it. But but it's still there. I, you know, I don't know how a person deals with it, frankly. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Yeah, I I, I like this idea of you know, these thought leaders waking up. I think that changes it from a grim picture of how on earth are we ever going to fix all of this stuff to a more individual responsibility. So if each person is in charge of their own consciousness um, and then utilizes their gifts in this incarnation to the best of their ability... To make things better. I mean, that's kind of a, a way more beautiful picture, I think. Oh, um, yeah. But, but I think I'm glad that you're sitting here talking about the science because this is really key. Some people still, some people listening to this podcast, I mean, some are you know going to be all up on your work and Terrence's work, and some are listening to this podcast likely still feeling that psychedelics are drugs and they... Fry your brain. They kill your brain. That was in the 60s. Sure. I don't want to touch that stuff. Right. Um, You know, and and maybe this is a stretch to say, but I would would say it's the older generations particularly that are still kind of 
have a, a lot of fear surrounding all this. And I don't know if that's true. No, I, I mean, I guess it's well, probably maybe everybody. I'm the older generation. Well, yes, but you're an anomaly, Dennis. <laughs> I don't think so. No? I don't think so. I yeah. think just by the fact that I'm part of this baby boomer generation, mm. you know, and we grew up with psychedelics in the 60s. And mm, some of true. us never got over it, right? So, I mean, I maybe let's scratch my generalized statement and then just say, with for people with fear who are scientific-minded people, right. can you speak to that to maybe you know, address, address the fear that someone might have who has maybe interest in trying psychedelics for the first time but is still really afraid they're going to do damage to their brain? Well, you know, I, I mean, I've often said that, you know, I've often said that you don't need faith to take a psychedelic. In fact, faith is kind of an impediment. Faith is an impediment to a lot of things. I, my stance is basically that when I think of faith, I think of religious dogma. I think of essentially faith is to be asked to believe something without any evidence. So that's not scientific. You know, that's anti-scientific. And uh, I mean, that's religious. That's, you know, faith is uh, a mandate to stop thinking and stop asking questions and just accept it that wiser entities than you know more about it you should stop asking all these pesky questions you know and just accept it on faith fuck faith you don't need faith how about thinking how about learning to think and uh, especially analytical thinking which is actively discouraged by dogma-based structures, you know. So uh, part of that trope is you do not take, you know, you don't need faith to take a psychedelic. It's You can be as skeptical as you want. What you need is courage. Mm. That's the thing. If you, you have to be open-minded and brave enough to put your fears aside or temporarily suspend your fears and take the plunge, literally. I and mean, it's like there are two people, two kinds of people in the world, those who have taken psychedelics and those who haven't. You can't have a useful conversation about psychedelics if you've never taken one. Mm -hmm. And people who you know, accept the propaganda you know, I mean, it is, I mean, it's unfortunate that there is all this propaganda. People just accept it unquestioningly. Uh, they have bought into it. And so they've taken this potential experience, potentially one of life's most meaningful experiences, off the table. It's, oh, it's too dangerous. It's going to fry my brain. It's going to... They don't really worry about that. They're worried that it's going to shake up their idea system. You know, my brother used to say often, psychedelics make you have funny ideas, you know, and funny ideas are inherently dangerous, you know, because they're not conventional ideas. Yeah, psychedelics are dangerous. They make you have funny ideas. It's not that the drugs themselves are particularly dangerous. You know, but but so people who are not open to it, they've just closed off this whole area of potentially meaningful experience, the life transforming experience, as as we know. But we're on the other side of that fence. You know, we know from experience what these things can do, what their value is, and so on. If you've never done anything like that, it looks scary from the outside. Mm -hmm. It looks scary. I don't know what you do other than try to educate people. It's always about education. You know, uh, if they, I mean, there are certain, there are many people who, you know, their attitude toward psychedelics, their attitude toward life, you know, is kind of my mind is made up. Don't confuse me with facts, you know. 
can't really get to those people. But if there are people who are a little more open-minded, who maybe they're afraid of, uh, of psychedelics because of potential damage that they may suffer, uh, the key to that is to educate them, is, is education. You know, there's plenty of sources uh, what where would you people recommend? can find out what's really going on. I mean, Michael Pollan's mm. book is a good example. How to Change Your Mind. How to Change Your Mind, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, it is a, it's not written for people familiar with psychedelics. It's written for people who are not familiar with psychedelics. Mm. And in that sense, it's a it's a very good teaching tool, mm. you know. But if people are just not open to the discussion, well, you're wasting your time to try and convince those people. I don't think people. I don't think most people are like that, mm. you know. And and this thing about thought leaders. I mean, the thought leaders, you know, the true thought leaders probably already know about psychedelics. You know, they're they've had their encounters. You know, they've been beyond the chrysanthemum and maybe what they learned is making a difference you know other people uh, you know like there are many people of my generation who grew up in the counterculture we know what they were and now we've ascended to positions of power and authority you know and maybe they don't do psychedelics anymore but they remember you know their previous experiences and many of those people are coming back to it as all this new information emerges. You know, there's been an article in the New York Times recently about elders who have rediscovered psychedelics through taking ayahuasca, you know, and they had largely forgotten what their ex- original experiences were like. So they rediscovered that, and it's been a revelation for them. So we have that. You know, and uh, we need to, uh, you know, we we need to make clear to people, and I don't know how you do this because this is one of these things that it's hard to have a rational conversation about. You end up talking past each other. We need to find a way to present it to people in a way that they'll be receptive to. Mm. You know, so that they can say, well, you know, based on what we know now and all the experience we've had, psychedelics have existed in our society for, you know, as a major, as as at least a presence in society for, you know, at least 50 years now. You know, so we've learned a thing or two. I mean, these things came from indigenous cultures. They were the ones that had the gnosis of how to use these things. But we've invented our own ways of using them. We've adapted to them. We know how to use these things. We have a body of knowledge that will let people use use these things in a in a beneficial way. So it's not like we haven't learned anything. But you know, it's the old adage: you can leave a horde, lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Yeah, it's a slippery slope. I mean, no one wants to be proselytized to. Doesn't no matter whether it's re- religion or something like psychedelics or becoming a vegan. I mean, nobody yeah. nobody wants to be talked at like that. I don't know if that's true. I think some people. I think some people do like to be pro- proselytized too. I think that some people want simple answers, you know, and uh, you know they just want to be told what to think. I mean, th- this is where demagoguery and all of these. Look at the Trump phenomenon, for example. I mean, you know, uh, how do you convince someone who is part of Trump's base that, you know, all the terrible things he's done? I mean, again, it's the case of my mind is made up. I'm not open to a rational conversation. And and this this is a problem in our society is we've abandoned reason. You know, you, it, we, we don't make arguments for reason much anymore. Well, and I would argue it's not even, this is my opinion, but it's not all about reason. I think part of the, the, the reason we're in this debacle is because we've cut ourselves off from our feeling life and from, you know, that feminine core, which is Gaia. 
Yeah. So if we can have these conversations, and yeah, it's it's great to have the science and the logic and everything to back it up, but ultimately I'm sitting across from you and we're mirrors of each other. Yeah. So the understanding comes from me understanding what you're feeling and you're understanding what I'm feeling. That's when we have that symbiosis, so to speak. Right. So in a way, right. when the more that I ask about this in my journeys is is how do we spread the medicine or this idea of waking up? It's it's just to become it. Yeah. 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 What's different though about the conversation we're having is that we're listening to each other and we're responding based on that exchange. But it's it's surprising how many conversations don't happen that way. Everyone has their position, they're in different corners. There's no opportunity for really real exchange of information or dialogue. Everyone's too busy defending their own position. And and uh and this is a problem, you know, mm-hmm. that so yeah, I, I agree that reason is not the uh you know, re- reason is not the whole solution, but it's a part of a respect for reason is part of the solution because it implies a ability to take in information and acknowledge it as true and maybe change our point of view based on new information. Many people don't want to do that. You know, they don't want new information. They're afraid of it because they may have to change their point of view. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so this, uh, this denialism is going to be the death of us, probably literally, until until we wake up, until we do something about it. And uh, it's not clear, you know, time is getting short. You know, I don't know what you do in the time. that Because the, the more we wait around, the more we dither, the greater the challenges are. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, and I'm glad you brought up time because this was actually somebody else's question. Many people feel that time itself is is speeding up. And I I would love to hear your thoughts on, you know, the nature of time and where are we heading and Well, I think I think the uh the meme of the time wave, you know, had a lot to do with that. And time wave theory. The time wave theory and the idea propagated in that the time is actually speeding up and that it's going to come to an end, that we're approaching some kind of singularity. I don't think it works exactly like that. I don't think time itself is speeding up. I mean, time itself, the physicists will tell you, is not is an illusion, actually. You know, what but what we seem to be living in a world where time is speeding up because more and more events are happening in a given span of time you know and and even using these terms you have to you know they're not accurate but we have an impression that many 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 more things are happening all the time terence said once sorry to interrupt but terence said uh which lasts longer a million years in which nothing happens or 10 seconds with fifty thousand events crammed into it yeah there you go yeah that's the difference. And time is a subjective experience, mm. you know. I mean, that's really, that's how we experience time. Mm. You know, we have clocks and so on that that measure it, but it's our subjective experience of time. And I think that this is part of the, the problem where, uh, you know, immersed in these information fields, we have far more stimuli that we have to deal with per microsecond than we ever had before mm-hmm. you know not so good if what you want to do is just sit quietly and and be you know uh the way that we experience time the way our culture works is not friendly to that you know so yes that's a problem yeah yeah so i would love to talk about your book briefly um, the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, which is your story about life with your brother Terrence. Yeah. And um, one of my favorite stories from your book is about the experiment at La Chirera. 
And um, I was wondering if if you would talk about that adventure and kind of like what's what spawned that adventure in the first place, what inspired you to go on that journey and what were you seeking? Oh, well, <laughs> I'm always reluctant to, to talk about it because uh, to try to reconstruct it uh, is useless. And I've talked about it many times. And the thing is, You know, mo most of our lives were lived after the experiment of Lachera. You know, so in some ways, and we had full lives. We had careers, family, all of that stuff after Lachera. This is something that happened to us when we were 20. I was 20 years old. You know, most of my life is unfolded after that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a great adventure, but... I don't really want to have my life identified with only that. Mm -hmm. You know, a few totally. things have happened since then. One or two. Yeah. One or two. Yeah. 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 Totally. So I am always reluctant to go back to that because, because, yeah, we had a lot of uh, funny ideas about things mm -hmm. and uh, we were passionate enough about it, motivated enough about it to go to the Amazon in search of what we thought was an exotic drug, but then late in, in the execution of it ended up being about something very different. I uh, love it. Essentially I love... a campaign to end history you know, <laughs> that wasn't really on our agenda when we left for the Amazon, but this is what was presented, you know, and so. Uh, it know. was four of you, right? Hmm? There were four of you. I, lo I yeah. love this idea of, you know, when I first heard you tell this story, you talk about all of you being dressed in white with long hair and and beards and just kind of wandering off into the wilderness, um, searching for something. And I just thought that was so beautiful and, and idealistic. <laughs> and I, I laughed when, you, you know, you, you were searching for one thing and you ended up stumbling upon a very different thing. Yeah. And, and I think that's pretty much what life is to some degree you know oh, i we, do i agree yeah. yes it it is serendipity yeah you know it's it's the quality of serendipity and the most interesting things happen accidentally mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. that was certainly true of the experiment in la Chirera. you know we had a, you know what what we thought was a fairly mundane you know adventure enough you know but but we were you know it was an ethnobotanical expedition there was no you know there was uh nothing beyond that well in fact that's not true you know i can't really honestly say that it was <laughs> it was an ethnobotanical expedition but we also had the sense that there was more and we all sort of participated in that. I mean, all this talk about the secret, which we shared, and even the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, you know, which was kind of a tongue-in-cheek characterization of our little band, <laughs> uh, you know, which there were five, five. actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, uh, so we sensed that there was something more. And as I talked about it when I discussed that, in the presentation, you know, this drug that we went looking for, the ukuhe, uh, it was the siren song. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the thing that that grabbed us, that that pointed to the Amazon, that seemed important enough to go and get. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was just to get us there. You know, and then once we got there, that whole thing just got shoved aside. You know, and then we were in the situation of dealing with the mushrooms. And the mushrooms, you know, pretty much reordered our priorities. Because you, you found know. them. As we found them, yeah. yeah. As we got to La Chirera and started consuming them and dealing with, uh, you know, all these idea complexes that they were presenting about, you know, essentially how you turn your body into... Uh, a UFO, 
you know, uh, if you want to put it that way. There, there's an, you know, and and so it started downloading instructions, and at that point, I think we we crossed the line from, you know, a mundane scientific expedition looking for some exotic indigenous hallucinogen to something much weirder. How know. long were you there? In the Amazon? Yeah. Well, we were there about uh, well, there about four months, you know, but we were only on the trip about two weeks. Okay. You know, so when we, so from the time that we did the experiment to the time that we more or less uh, got airlifted out and all that. It was roughly. You got airlifted out. Yeah, eventually we got airlifted out. How did that hap- How did that unfold? Well, uh, our uh, our companions, uh, uh, two of our companions, were convinced that you know it, they were looking at a that. It was a psychiatric problem, you mm-hmm. know. It was a mental health crisis. There, they were very much within the framework of how you would deal with this conventionally, and it's basically these these people have gone bonkers, and uh, they need to get to a hospital, get to psychiatric intervention, mm-hmm. which was not possible uh, being in the Amazon. I mean, we couldn't, you know, we we. We couldn't uh, just call an ambulance or anything, and I'm very grateful for that. I've actually, you know, it would have been a very different outcome if it hadn't been able to play out. Mm. You know, the experience unfolded. It was very much between Terence and myself, and we understood what was going on. Within our conceptual framework, we knew exactly what we were doing. Everyone else was outside that, and they are baffled. They're like, well, these people are just, it's crazy talk. This is nuts, you know? And and our response was, no, it's not nuts. You know, we know what we're doing, or at least we think we know what we're doing. In fact, we didn't know what we were doing. But, but we, you know, what we said was, just let this play out, you know, let the psychosis or whatever it is play out. And they were forced to do that. At know. that point, w- were you, I mean, did you have the awareness to ask yourself the question, I could be having a psychotic break? Or like was no, psychosis we, on your mind or you, you were? We were not thinking about psychotic breaks. Y- you weren't? No. Yeah, they no. were, okay. Um, they were, but w- we were not. We, we, that wasn't the framework that that we understood it in. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Uh and I'm very, and, and I think we were more right than they were. I mean, it, it, you, you can you can make the you can make the case that it was a shamanic initiation. It had a lot of those characteristics, okay. you know, of being torn apart and put back together. That's classic initiatory. Uh, aspects of shamanism in almost all cultures. So you could say, well, it was that, you know, or you could say it was a psychotic break. Shamanism, shamanic initiations often resemble psychotic breaks to the outside people. Or you could say that it was alien encounter. And as I explained in the talk I gave, there were all of those elements were present. You know, I'm not saying it was alien encounter. I'm not saying it was any of these things. I'm saying it had aspects of all of these elements, all of these things, you know, and probably the most reductionist and simplest explanation was that it was some kind of a psychotic break, Mm -hmm. you know, but there were aspects of it that didn't really fit that model. Mm -hmm. Not least of which was the fact that we both recovered, you know, as the process was able to play out. And I think if there had been a psychiatric intervention at that point, it would have been the worst thing that could have happened, Mm. you know, because it would have interrupted this this self-healing process because that's what it was. You know, it was a complete... Just burn it to the ground, you know, this this default mode network or who we thought we were, all of these things. Just burn all that to the ground and build it back from the ground up, so, which, which took place. 
So your default mode network is essentially annihilated and you have this huge paradigm shift and your consciousness is forever different. You don't regret any, I mean, you wouldn't trade that experience, would you? I don't know what I'd trade it for. Well, because then, I mean, my follow-up question to that is like, does it actually matter whether it was a psychotic break, a shamanic initiation, or an alien encounter? As long as you you ascribe meaning. Right. It doesn't actually matter. Right. I mean, you can put different interpretations on it. But the thing is, there's nothing else. There's nothing to trade it for. Mm -hmm. You know, what would I have traded it for? Just continue my studies and... and, Mm -hmm be a student and study botany and all that, which I went on and did that, you know, but I took, you know, four months out of my life and I did this other very strange thing, (laughs) which I do cherish. I mean, I feel like, you know, I, I feel like it's made me the person I am in a certain way. And I feel like having gone through that at that age, uh, it was a coming of age in a certain way. I mean, this, you know, if you look at the etiology of schizophrenia, um, it very often shows up when you're early 20s, late adolescent. So on that level, it fits. Um, you know, but the fact that, uh, that the process could happen in this isolated place and there was no attempt to intervene, you know, with medications or with even with therapy. It was just, we were out there. We had, there was nothing to do but live through it and try to come back together, which happened. And I think, uh, you know, I don't know about Terrence. I mean, in some ways you could say that Terrence never recovered. You know, but that would be a maybe an unkind thing to say. But in some sense, it's true in that there were certain understandings that came to him, to us, uh, like the time wave, like the idea that the mushrooms were a conduit to extraterrestrial knowledge or alien knowledge, whatever it was. He lived with those notions for 20 years after La Chirera, 30 years after La Chirera. And I sort of didn't, you know, I sort of, I had this serious psychotic break where I didn't even know who I was or where I was or what was going on. But after that two week period, I kind of got back down to earth and, uh, and I was very happy to be down to earth. And, and it was like, you know, I didn't have these persistent delusions, if mm-hmm. you if you want to put it that way. And, and you know, which which in Terrence's cases were not. I mean, they were delusions, but they were also a source of his creativity. Mm-hmm. You know, so they weren't uh, they weren't delusions that made it, uh, you know, impossible for him to interact normally with people. I mean, he did interact normally with people and was totally functional in many ways. And, uh, you know, but it's just sometimes the conversation drifted into some very weird places. And, you know, and he turned a career, he made a career out of that. Mm. So that was kind of a creative adaptation to it. Um, When you talk about not knowing who you were or what you were, I think you know, it's important for context for people that don't know this story that, and actually, I think the whole thing is actually very cinematic. I am surprised no one's ma- made a, <laughs> uh, a Hollywood movie out of it. We yet, were hoping. <laughs> because like, you know, for me, there's this image <clears throat> of all of you, you know, bearded, long hair with the white, and you stumble upon this field of, of cows. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 And what you what did you find? In that field. Well, we found cows. We found cow shit. Cow shit. <laughs> Out of every cow shit pile was growing clusters of mushrooms. So there's just hundreds yeah. of them? You stumble Pretty upon much. hundreds of psilocybin mushrooms. Well, they weren't that thick, but they were scattered around the pasture. You know, 400 acres of 400 hectares of pasture, whatever it was. And you you immediately knew what they were. We knew what they were because we'd done our homework, yeah. Okay, but you'd never tried them. We had uh, had uh, 
encounters with them on the way to La Chirera, a couple of places we'd been, had mushrooms, uh, but it was it was the dry season, so they were hard to find. Mm. We just found one or two specimens. We tried them, you know, and no, typical light mushroom trip, very nice, you know. That was maybe um, part of the seductive aspects of the mushrooms was that you know we said, these seem very friendly, very easy to use, and they're funny, and they're. You know, they're all those things that mushrooms are. So that when we got to La Chirera, our defenses had already been disabled to a certain extent, or our suspicions. It was like, oh, wow, these are the same mushrooms we saw in Puerto Leguizimo. These will be fun to eat while we wait for the real mystery. And then because of the fact that there wasn't a lot to eat, we started eating them rather carelessly and, and pretty much you every day. Them, yeah, every almost every meal you said you almost were adding Almost every them. meal, yeah, yeah. For how long? Oh, before things got strange, not very long. A few days, you mm. know, I mean, a, a, a few days, a week maybe, something like that. Wow, so. that's an immense amount of mushrooms. It was a lot of mushrooms, yeah, yeah, and and I I think you can, you know, you can probably replicate that experiment, uh, you know, if you want to. I mean, if you want to drive yourself crazy with mushrooms, you could probably do it. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about one point becoming what you call co-contiguous. Yes. Yeah. Can you can you describe that? Well, it was yeah, it was the. Uh, Co-contiguous means my boundaries and the boundaries of the cosmos were the same, mm -hmm. as I understand it, as I experienced it. I, you know, it, it goes back to the cosmic oneness kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we are, we are not separate from the universe. We are the universe. And at the beginning of this 14-day sort of recondensation of myself that took place over... 14 days, it started out with me being feeling at least that I was co contiguous with the boundaries of space time. You know, I mean, I was the boundaries, of, I, I was the universe. So, talk about ego inflation and all that, <laughs> except there was no ego involved. <laughs> but uh, that's what I meant by that. And how long were you, you were in that state for? Oh, a week or something? It took uh, took about 14 days after the experiment at La Chirera to come down to the point where, you know, I was functional. Where, yeah. you know, I knew there was an inside and outside. Wow. I could pick up a fork. I could, <laughs> you know, do that kind of stuff. So but, it, but there were echoes of it for a long time after that. I mean, even when I was... Uh, after we'd left La Chirera, we were in no way completely recovered, you know. Right. I, and I, I was, I remember after we uh, left La Chirera and uh, actually got ourselves back to Bogota, we went out to a very nice restaurant, and uh, I was utterly convinced that all the waiters were telepathic and I could hear their thoughts and that all of this movement of the plates and everything was happening through teleportation. And well, I was seriously fucked up, <laughs> <laughs> but harmless basically. <laughs> and so it did take a while for all of this wow. to fade away. And I reached a point finally where I was functional enough to, uh, you know, to, to go back to the States. And, uh, you know, at that point I was very invested in, uh, just keeping my feet on the ground, getting my feet back on the ground and keeping them on the ground mm -hmm. for a while. I think that's one reason even that I decided to study science more intensively because I felt that it was an anchor for mm -hmm. me. It was a, you know, something tangible that I could grab onto. Mm -hmm. And direct my studies in that in that direction, you know. And I think, uh, I mean, 
I think a lot of, I think, I don't know, I think many psychedelic researchers in some ways, uh, you know, they have that same, they have the same motivation. They have the same attitude. They want to be close to the mystery, right? And everyone says that it is a mystery, but not too close, right? Because the mystery is dangerous. The mystery has a radiation field, you know, and if you get caught into it like I do, then you go down the the wormhole of the screaming abyss. And But scientists can introduce that, that arm's length filter of objectivity and scientific examination and and all that, you know, and that lets them engage with the mystery at arm's length, but not actually participate in, you know, you know what I'm saying? What mm. is the real mystery? Mm. Uh, but they can they can uh, satisfy themselves that it, it's important and they're they're studied aspects of it, you know, uh, all of these. And I, I don't dismiss or, you know, as a psychedelic research. I think it's very important. Um, so I don't want, I, I don't want to be, be heard to be discrediting or devaluating that. That's all a lot of good work. But what distinguishes uh, psychedelic research on these states of consciousness is you're looking at it from the outside in. You know, you apply all these external ways to measure it. You know, you can do fMRIs, you can do, you know, psychological questionnaires, you can do all kinds of things. You're still looking into the window from the outside. You know, and I think for some people, um, so, you, you know, you, I mean, I think this is a big challenge in neuroscience in general. You know, we can do, we can make all sorts of measurements about what the brain does. We can look at it from the outside. We can say, you know, these are the parts that light up when you're having a psychedelic experience. That so we can take fMRIs and we can see that as it happens. Or, you know, we can, uh, we can say, you're solving a mathematical equation. And when you're in an fMRI, then, you know, you can see what's going on when you're doing that or when you're thinking about some other topic, you know, and you can get these windows into the brain, but you don't cross, you don't make the connection between the subjective experience and the objective measurement. Mm. And it may be that it's a threshold that can't be crossed. I'm not sure. You know, will we ever have a machine like an fMRI that, you know, will project those experiences onto a screen or that, you know, you and I could hook up directly and you could have the same dream I'm having? I mean, this happens with psychedelics sometimes, but it's not exactly a controllable situation, you know. Mm. We were I mean, talking group group collective experiences are not uncommon with ayahuasca. Mm, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like we hook into something different. Yeah. Mhm. Mm that's really interesting. We were talking earlier about your experiences this week and I was asking you a little bit about your ceremonies and and the depths that you were going to and whether you, whether you're not whether or not you had visions. And I think, you know, we talked about this too, is some people make a big deal out of the visions. Oh, it's all about the visions. But yeah. not always, you know, there's a lot of just beautiful stuff that happens just within the body. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you had shared that for you, you're actually somewhat slowing down on the amount of psychedelics that you yourself are choosing to take. Is that accurate i wouldn't say i'm slowing down on on the amount i still take them pretty regularly mm -hmm. uh, but i may be slowing down on ayahuasca i'm getting the message from ayahuasca or i don't know if it's a message you could interpret it that way but my my experiences more recently are that i'm just not getting to the depths of insights that I used to get to. Mm -hmm. And 
I think it's unlikely that that's because I've learned everything there is to know <laughs> from ayahuasca. I don't think that's true. You always learn new things, but maybe it's maybe I've reached a place where I just need to step away from it for a while. You mm. know, I mean, uh, and uh, that doesn't mean I won't go back to it. I will go back to it, but you know, there are other psychedelics too. I haven't been taking mushrooms very often. Maybe I need to do that more often. Mm. You know, or yeah. So. Uh, you were talking about a period in Terrence's life, actually, where he decided to stop taking psychedelics. Yeah. And you, you were kind of, um, you were endearingly joking that you gave him a hard time. I did give him a hard time. Um, it was a different dynamic. You know, his decision to stop taking mushrooms was uh, abrupt. It was a result of uh, a couple of very difficult trips that he had, uh, which were, I think, fundamentally unsettling to his worldview. I don't know exactly what happened or, or how it presented, but he, he was knocked back on his heels by a couple of these trips and decided, essentially became afraid of it, I think. And uh, and that's okay. That's that's perfectly all right. I understand that. What bothered me was that these things had happened, and he either didn't acknowledge it, uh, he didn't share that with his audience. He was in a position to be the the you know sort of world spokesman for psychedelics, especially mushroom, and that had continued to. You know, it's this thing, you paint yourself in a corner, you become a spokesman for these things, for whatever ideas you're you're promoting. And then maybe if you have doubts, you have to st still keep talking about it. And I felt that there was a lack of honesty, that he was not being honest with himself or with his fans. You know, I thought it would have been better if he shared that with his fans and said, you know, I've had some really disturbing experiences, you know, with uh, mushrooms. And, uh, but he didn't share that. He was, he was very private, you know, he, and it's very, it's difficult for a very private person to be a public figure. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that was a, that was an anomaly, a conundrum that he faced. You know, his inclination was to be a hermit. I mean, he's very, very introverted, and yet here he is on the public stage, you know, talking about mushrooms. I think that was a cognitive dissonance for him, and I think these experiences, he didn't really know what to do with it. By that point, he, I mean, he couldn't turn it around and say, you know, maybe these mushrooms... Maybe people shouldn't be taking them. <laughs> you know, he couldn't exactly say that. <clears throat> and uh, he could have said, well, maybe I shouldn't be taking them. But he was caught in a situation where he had to promote mushrooms. And I, I sort of thought, I, I criticized him for that. I said, you know, well, two things. I said, if you're going to be the main spokesman for mushrooms, you need to take mushrooms. It's just part of walking your talk. You know, if you're going to say everyone else should take them, you should take them, right? And and otherwise, you're, you're not being honest to yourself or to your fan base. You know, so I, I criticized him on that level, not that he had uh, reservations about continuing to take them, but that but that, you know, he, he misrepresented his experiences in, in the service of the public figure and the advocacy that he had created for himself. And I understand that, too. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was a shtick. It was a way to, like, make a living, you know. People paid him to go to places and talk about it and all that. Um, so... You know, when you do that, 
I mean, you can't just decide one day, you know, I think I'm going to stop being a, a, you know, a national spokesman for mushrooms and go study cost accounting or something. You know, I mean, you can't really re-engineer your career that way, mm. you know. And, and I think that was a cognitive dissonance to him. He was trapped in a certain way. I felt bad for him, you know. But I, I mean, I felt like uh, I could sense the the dilemma he found himself in, and because all this happened at a time when he was beginning to have doubts about things like the time wave and, and that sort of thing. But he couldn't. He, I guess he didn't have enough of a rapport with his audience that he could come out and, and say, you know, you know, guys, I've been having a lot of doubts lately. I don't think anyone would have disrespected him for it. You know, uh, I mean, I'm going through something, I'm, I'm going through something similar myself, you know, right now with my relationship with ayahuasca. Uh, but for what, but what's different is that, you know, ayahuasca didn't show me something really disturbing, you know, that I don't want to look at again. Um, you know, I mean, that has happened, uh, you know, and, and a point that I made to Terence when he was having this crisis is there was some blockage there. You shouldn't stop taking mushrooms. You should continue to take them. You know, you should get to the bottom of this. What is this? You know, there are the tools that can help you get behind this and figure out what what it is that's disturbed you so much. And with me, it's not that there was one or two abrupt experiences that, that scared the hell out of me. It, it hasn't been like that. It's that I'm just not getting much experience at all. You know, not much insight, not much, not much of anything. Um, and so... I don't know. Hmm. I'm thinking about what you said earlier about meaning. And what I'm really curious about is with all you've done, with all you've read, with all of your research, all of your travels, to find yourself sitting where you are currently what does it feel like you're being called to do? Or what is the legacy currently for Dennis McKenna? Uh, you don't ask the easy questions, do you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess, I guess I'm in the process of sorting that out. You know, I feel like I am at a another pivotal point in my life. Um, I've always been a teacher. I think of myself as a teacher, basically an academically oriented person. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy, you know, sharing information in creative ways with, with brilliant young minds who are probably a lot smarter than I am. You know, and that that is very gratifying for me. You know, to uh, to share these crazy ideas. You know, and just not that they have to be true. You know, you just you can have fun with them. You know, thinking is fun. Uh, speculating is fun. I like that. So, I guess with this idea for the McKenna Academy, uh, since I never really got accepted in conventional academics, you know. Uh, and yet I do like that model of, of learning and, uh, and teaching. And so I said, well, okay, I'll just start my own damn academy <laughs> and, you know, try and create it that way. So if that's going to be my legacy, I, that, that's the legacy. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to uh, create a, uh, a framework for brilliant minds to come together and and discuss and talk about cool stuff, you know, things that are ideas that are exciting. And with the help of plant medicines, just uh, integrate that into it as that's part of the learning 
tool. You know, I want to create this psychedelic university in the spirit of Eleusis, you know, of the mystery schools, because it's all a mystery, right? I mean, I've long since abandoned the idea that I'm going to figure it all out, you know, or that anyone is going to figure it all out. I think the universe, the more light... Sorry about that. <laughs> Can you edit all this stuff out? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to leave that in just for you, Dennis. You're going to leave me. Yeah, <laughs> the microphone right, right. takes a tumble into your lap. Right. Um, I, I think that we have to I think that we have to come to terms with the fact that we know very little. In the end, we know very little. As a species, we think we know a lot. Ayahuasca repeatedly tells me that we don't know shit. And I think as a human being, an individual, I think we have to accept that we know very little about, you know, this multi-layered, marvelous universe that there is the more layers you pull away the more complex it gets the more fascinating it gets i suspect there's no end to that and some people would say oh my god we're never going to figure all this out you know and i say yay <laughs> that's good what would we do with ourselves yeah. if we figured it all out True. You know, then we what go back to watching Netflix or something, or or you know, not mm. there's anything wrong with watching Netflix, but you know what I mean. Just go back to the distractions. Uh, there's an infinite uh, number of things to ponder, you know, and be amazed at about, and uh, and I think that's pleasurable. You know, that's fun. Just using the mind is fun. Mm. And thinking about cool stuff, and mm. uh, and there's an infinite supply of it, basically, far more than one person can digest, and uh, you know, more so. I mean, now because there is so much information, any one person can only know a little bit about things. You know, and that that's just the world we live in. I mean, I guess we should be grateful that there's, uh, you know, so much information. But in a way, it uh, it makes it hard to be a generalist, you know. You know, back in the day, you know, somebody like da Vinci, I mean, they were an inventor, they were an artist, they were, you know, a botanist, a medical investigated they did all these things the so-called renaissance man right or i guess they didn't have renaissance women we never hear about the renaissance women you know but i'm sure they were out there you know and and they had he had skills in all these different areas you know but how could he do that well partly because the totality of each specialty that was known could be apprehended by a single person. We didn't know that much. Well, now that's impossible. You know, you you can you can spend all of your life, you know, studying a fungus that grows on the on the you know front appendage of a cockroach, and you can devote your entire life to study that. Why you would want to, I don't know. But for some people, maybe that's their passion. You know, I mean. So that's kind of an interesting thing, you know. In in some ways, we're 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 blessed to have uh, access to, you know, essentially ninety five percent of human knowledge. It's right here, you know. Mm. Uh, is that a good thing? I don't know. Mm. It is the fact, um, you know. And in some sense, I think it's a good thing. But then there is this this is this this potential to, uh, you know, just get overwhelmed by it all and throw up your hands and say, I I can't deal with it anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you made a really good point before when you brought up the fact that you were talking about the experiment, and you're like, you know, there's so much more to my life than just that event, yes. you know? And you talk about this stuff a lot. You're traveling all the time, you're giving lectures. And I was thinking about, like, I wonder what is something about Dennis 
that he's never gotten to say before, that no one's ever asked him just about Dennis the man, not necessarily the body of work. And I was like, I'm going to ask him, you know, so what is, you know, what is something just totally separate from your work that is just like a fun, fun fact about you that's, that maybe people have never heard before? Do you have a, like a, what do you, what do you like to do when you're not doing this stuff all the time and, you know, you're so dedicated, but what, what's your like guilty pleasure? Do you, do you have a favorite food or, you know? Well, yeah, I, I have all those things. You know, I have favorite foods. I like to read science fiction. Mm, what's is, your ta- What's your which favorite? Which is not exactly separate from all these other no, things. No, it's not. That, that's what got us into all this in the first place. But I like to do that. I like to uh, just cogitate, just think about things, you know. Um, but again, that's kind of what, what I do, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can separate it from, it's not clear. I, I can't answer the question. Okay. So if you had to order takeout. <laughs> if I order takeout. If you had to be? order takeout, what type of takeout food, a particular type of ethnic cuisine, what, you know, what, what would you be ordering? Well, probably Indian food. Indian food. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like that. And are you um, are you into documentaries? Are you into yeah. yeah? So what are you watching? Have you have you watched anything lately that either relevant to this or not relevant that you found was a really yes yeah yeah. There's one one documentary which uh, I like. It's on Netflix. I liked it so much. I've watched it twice. It's a ten part series and uh, it's called One Strange Rock. Have you seen that? One that one? one Strange Rock. One Strange Rock. Okay. It's a 10-part uh, documentary. Uh, it's narrated by Will Smith. It is, and the, the other people talking about, you know, the talking heads in the documentary are all astronauts who have spent a lot of time on the space station. And it's interesting. Astronauts, especially if they spend a lot of time in space, looking at the earth these people rave like mystics you know i mean it's they are not like you and me they they have that cosmic perspective and it really enriches it it's it's just a beautiful documentary the photography the cinematography and what they talk about is just fascinating to me and uh, it's just beautifully made i highly recommend it Sounds wonderful. Yeah, it's uh, and and what it what it really makes clear is all the stuff that we have been talking. The fact that the Earth is an organism that it's self regulating, and you know that the Earth is alive. The Earth is what's keeping itself alive. The whole planet. You can see this from space. You get this different perspective from space that you don't get down here, you know, because we're immersed in it. That that's, but, uh, I, that's a really inspiring, uh, documentary. I mean, there must be more out there like that, but that would really impress me. Mm-hmm. You should watch it. Oh, I will. You know what I mean? As I... soon as you see it, you'll know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dennis, it has been, my absolute pleasure to have you here today. I am humbled for the opportunity to sit down with you and to have met you earlier in the year and and began cultivating this wonderful friendship with you. It's always such a pleasure to see you in real person. And thank you so much for coming. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that we have this friendship too. You know, and uh, I'm sure it will last a long time. I hope so. Yes. Thank you so much. Very happy to have the conversation, Hallie.